Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Testing one, two.
I appreciate it. My throat's been killing me, so thank you. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Okay, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, Want to say hi? My name is Amy Kajacob. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Okay, good. Um, so, so I'm an allergist. Um, a, a little bit about me before we kind of get started. I uh, grew up in Cincinnati, um, did medical school there, and then came down here for residency fellowship. I um, am internal medicine trained, but. Um, allergy fellowship is odd in that you're kind of duly trained both pediatrics and adult and so now I practice mostly at children's um, and then I have a, a VA clinic as well and then do consults at kind of all three at children's UAB and uh, the VA um, after fellowship I was in private practice for a couple years um, and then recently back in the fall just came back to full-time academics kind of missed teaching and the kind of educational environment so a little bit of maybe a non-traditional path, but um, but but that's that's a little bit about me. So um, we're going to talk about anaphylaxis today. If you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me in the middle. Feel free, you know, raise your hand, shout out, whatever whatever works. Um, I have nothing to disclose, um, and we have some some learning objectives, um, things that I wanted to focus on. But we're going to be talking about a, a lot um, in the next you know 45 minutes to an hour talk about the pathogenesis and how these kind of immediate hypersensitivity or allergic reactions kind of work in the body. Um, evaluate different causes. We're going to go a lot over that. Different causes of anaphylactic reactions and maybe some points in your, you know, clinical history when you're taking a history from a patient, what you kind of want to uh, zone in on. Uh, identify the symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction because that can be tough sometimes. Um, and then kind of how to acutely treat um, an anaphylaxis. Um, so first I thought we would start with a case, something that um, presented to the VA. I think the fellow saw them initially. Um, a 50-year-old woman coming in with three kind of unexplained anaphylactic events um, over an eight-month period. And 
um, you know, no associated medicines that, sh that she could tell us about. You know, we like to talk about um, NSAIDs as a cause of anaphylaxis. She hadn't, hadn't taken any ibuprofen with any of these, no new medications. Um, and she was concerned about a possible food allergy. So the first episode um, was more mild, kind of just diffuse, head to toe hives. Uh, and it was about four hours after eating a dinner of steak and salad. Um, the next episode she had a couple months later um, was more severe. She had hives, nausea, diarrhea, and syncope two hours after eating tacos. Um, now, whenever I hear syncope in, in an allergic reaction history, that, that's concerning to me. I mean, that tells me that your anaphylaxis was severe enough that you became shocky. You dropped your blood pressure. So, um, so that's a very concerning thing to me. Um, the third event uh, had kind of, again, head to toe hives and swelling of the tongue, lips and ears, two hours after eating a taco salad and an enchilada with cheese sauce. So, um, so she came in, um, her physical exam was unremarkable. We did some skin testing on her, uh, checked her to, to beef, pork, chicken, lettuce, wheat, dairy, all negative. Um, and so she was prescribed an EpiPen. We kind of told her what we thought was going on, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, and started her on Zyrtec daily. Um, she didn't really, un you know, it, what we'll talk about, um, what this is, is a little bit of a hard sell to people. Um, didn't totally believe us. She went and on, on her way home, ate at McDonald's, and two hours later had, had hives and, and shortness of breath that responded to the epinephrine she had just filled. Um, and then the only kind of a, other environmental change she had was that her and her husband had recently moved from Tuscaloosa to a more rural area and were spending more time outdoors, um, clearing land for, you know, for the yard and more time in the garden. So we'll talk about it. Uh, this reaction history is a little, it's classic for this disease process, but but is maybe not as well known, so, but maybe I'll have an idea. Um, anaphylaxis um, was coined, uh, the term was coined a little bit after this in like 1908, thereabouts. Um, and, and I really love where it comes from. The, the suffix is Greek, like phylaxis means prevention. And so another term that we use all the time, like prophylaxis is for prevention. And so they named anaphylaxis after they started seeing these reactions, anaphylaxis, which is against protection. So I like how that, you know, kind of makes sense because I think a lot of things in medicine sometimes aren't <laughs> uh, really termed appropriately. So, um, so in general, I'm going to start with like a, you know, clinical pearls. Um, prophylaxis is key uh, for, for anaphylaxis. You, patients need to be well educated on their triggers, what exactly triggers them. If they're, you know, insect allergic, they need to know, you know, not to be going outside with, you, you know, and barefoot, what kind of environments to avoid based on what they're allergic to. Um, same thing with foods, you have to know what cross-contamination, there, there's a lot that can go into what exactly is their trigger for their anaphylaxis and how to avoid that. In general, food allergy is the most common cause of anaphylaxis and I know that, um, you know, food allergy is certainly getting a lot of press lately. I mean, it's much, you know, all the atopic disease, you know, everything from, you know, asthma, um, allergic rhinitis and food allergy, it's all increasing in prevalence. I mean, it wasn't an issue when, when I was in grade school. I don't remember people in my school having, having food allergy, but now it's, it's a huge deal. Um, you can't, I think the unsettling thing about anaphylaxis is, is that you cannot predict the severity of future reactions based on past ones. So just because a patient has had maybe, you know, if, if their trigger is, we'll say, peanut butter or something, if they've had peanut butter and if, if it's a child and they've only had you know, hives around their mouth, a little bit of swelling, you know, their, their reaction was limited to the skin, you can't get comfortable with that, and parents can't get comfortable with that, because I have no way of knowing if that next reaction is going to be much more severe or not. There are a number of different host factors and other environmental factors that go into, play into how severe a reaction can be. So, like other host factors, like we'll talk about, if, if, the, if the patient is sick at the time of, you know, the, the exposure to their allergen, if any, anything from a GI bug to, um, to a common cold, any, anything that your, your immune system is already revved up on alert and your reaction is going to be much worse. Um, if you've taken any NSAIDs recently, like ibuprofen, your reaction is going to be worse. If, uh, you know, anything that revs up your system, like I said, if you're you know, exercising, it, that's a risk for, for more severe reactions. If you're out in the heat, if you're overheated, that's more of a reaction. And then, like I said, the, the food, you know, if it's a food for peanut, you know, you're going to react differently to, based on the amount you know, the dose of the exposure, the, whether the peanut is boiled versus roasted. I mean, there's so much that goes into this. So you cannot predict how severe a reaction is going to be. 
and, and like we'll talk about when I do my skin testing and, or blood testing, you know, you can't, again, it says nothing about severity, but the bigger the number, the bigger the skin test size, it tells me about their likelihood of reacting with exposure, but not about the severity. Um, and in general, you know, with our, in our largest study of, um, of fatal anaphylactic reactions, there's in general, you know, the timeline to uh, a fatal, like a respiratory or cardiac arrest varies based on, based on um, what the etiology is. So five minutes for iatrogenic um, reactions, 15 minutes for venom, and about 30 for food reactions. So, you know, you can see that, and I think part of it is because of the route, you know, if it's iatrogenic, maybe those are hospitalized patients, they're already sick. Again, we talked about some host factors and, and a more direct route of exposure. These are maybe IV medications or, um, and, and so it can progress quickly and, and be severe um, and, and can be fatal despite, you know, appropriate treatment. In general, we're gonna be talking about IgE reactions versus non-IgE mediated reactions. So this is just kind of an overview. We're not gonna get too far into the weeds here. Um, but this is the mast cell. It's one of our allergy cells. And the mast cell has um, chock full of all, or I guess I don't have a pointer, um, chock full of the little purple dots in there, which are like, we'll say histamine. Um, it's different granules in the mast cell. And so histamine is, is what we fight, right, with our antihistamines. And, and is responsible for all of the all of our you know allergic reactions, our, our you know swelling, redness, inflammation, itching. Um, but the mast cell at all times it has a receptor on it, that FC epsilon R1 receptor, and the IgE molecule, which is IgE is our allergy antibody, and IgE is all the time sitting in that receptor, just ready um, and, and on alert. So when a mast cell becomes activated, because the patient get ex gets exposed to their allergen, whatever that is, if it's a food, if it's venom, if it's pollen, cat, dog, what happens is that the allergen cross-links the IgE that's sitting there in its receptor, and once a sufficient number of those IgE molecules kind of come together, they, um, once a sufficient number uh, you know, can activate the mast cell, the mast cell breaks open, releases the preformed things that we'll talk about, like histamine, and that's what gives you that immediate reaction with allergic reactions within, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15. Um, other things are also released, that, like cytokines, those are inflammatory um, chemicals in the body, things that are not preformed, but are, when the mast cell breaks open, they're synthesized new. And so it takes several hours for those things to be transcribed and to take their effect. So, that's when you get the inflammation of the late phase and, and like a biphasic reaction you can have with allergic reactions, you know, maybe four to eight hours later, it's because of those things that are kind of uh, synthesized de novo. Um, again, some of the other preformed mediators that you, that you get from activated mast cells, we talked about histamine. Um, tryptase is another thing that's found in mast cells and tryptase is used in a couple different ways we'll talk about. One way is, you know, if it's a if you're obtaining a, a baseline tryptase level when a patient's otherwise healthy, um, can be a screen for mastocytosis. Um, but acutely, and if you're trying to figure out whether something is anaphylactic, like IgE mediated versus anaphylactoid, which we'll talk about, um, which is not IgE mediated, you know, a tryptase can help you. Um, it, it peaks about one to six hours after an anaphylactic reaction. Um, won't help you immediately, it, you know, in the emergency room or, or treating that patient. Um, but you know, it's a send out test, you know, in our, in our lab. Um, but getting that result back later will help, you know, the primary care or whoever's treating the patient or the allergist uh, figure out exactly what was the nature of that reaction. And tryptase will consistently be uh, elevated in anaphylaxis with the exception of food related anaphylaxis. Tryptase tends to be negative. Um, other things that are preformed and immediately released are heparin, uh, TNF alpha is an inflammatory uh, cytokine, and other chemotactic factors. They, they attract other cells to come in and it just amplifies the response. Um, things that are generated or made new, leukotrienes, again, those are other kind of inflammatory mediators via a different allergy pathway in the body, uh, prostaglandin D2-alpha and platelet acti activating factor. Um, the anaphylactoid, you know, this term has a little bit fallen out of favor, um, but these describe the non-IgE mediated reactions. Don't go through that mast cell, the IgE molecule and the breaking open with histamine. Um, they can be immunologic, like a blood product transfusion, um, which again, based with the immune system, just not IgE. 
um, or there's a number of things in, that have a direct, direct mast cell effect. So it's not, again, IgE mediated, but they can contact the mast cell directly and cause them to break open and release histamine and all these things. So, um, so like IV contrast and vancomycin, it is very rare, like case reports, to have a true allergy, like a true IgE mediated reactions to these things. But red man's very common with the redness, the itching, and, and the same kind of anaphylactoid reaction with I IV contrast. Um, opiates, you know, patients complain all the time that if they get morphine, it causes itching, it causes hives, any of them, and it's just a direct mast cell effect. It's not an allergy, it's just, it's a pharmacologic kind of side effect of, of those medicines. Um, and neuromuscular blocking agents can do this as well. Um, so then we'll talk about a bunch of different causes for anaphylaxis. Um, again, food allergy we talked about is the most common reason for, for anaphylaxis. Um, but in general, it's a very, very small number of foods that cause the vast majority of our reactions. So while, yes, a patient can be allergic to something random, kiwi, you know, it, or <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's probably going to be one of these top eight things. So milk is the most common with egg kind of following behind it. Um, but again, that's not what gets most of the press. It's um, because generally you outgrow milk and egg, usually around kindergarten-ish age. Um, the vast majority of them do. So um, peanut and, and tree nut, peanut's the most common cause of fatal food anaphylaxis, and it's something you tend to keep lifelong. You know, only 15 to 20 percent of people outgrow their peanut or tree nut allergy. So, <coughs> so you're stuck with it for life. It tends to be very severe reactions, and so um, so peanut allergy is, like I said, what tends to get most of the, most of the attention. Um, fish and shellfish, again, just like peanut tree nut, you generally do not outgrow those, only about 15% do. Um, soy and wheat, those are more common in childhood and they are generally outgrown. Um, the odd thing about the seafood, whether it's the, the fin fish or the shellfish, just like the tree nut, uh, what's a little disconcerting about it too is that you can develop those at any time. You know, milk or egg allergy is not going to hit you when you're 65, but I, I can't tell you how many vets I have that, you know, they, they're eating shrimp every, you know, every day, you know, and then and they're 65, and then boom, one day they eat it, and they have a severe anaphylactic reaction, and then they're going to keep it lifelong. We don't really understand why your immune system kind of changes on you like that, but, but seafood and tree nuts are known to do that. Um, another kind of IgE-mediated reaction that can lead to anaphylaxis is what's called oral allergy syndrome. Um, you may have heard, or heard this or you know, maybe have it yourself. Um, it's in very, very pollen allergic patients that have really terrible spring, summer, fall seasons. Um, what happens, is, and it's really interesting, the, the classic case here is, is what I kind of made a little picture of. It's the birch tree pollen, which flares in the spring, like right now, um, and apple. So what, the, what most of the time you're allergic to is, is the protein in that offending thing. So they're all proteins, except for the weird delayed allergy to meat that we're going to talk about, which is a carbohydrate antigen. But so the protein in birch tree pollen looks identical, and we can pair up specific pollens to specific fruits and vegetables. Um, looks identical to the protein in apple. So people are really pollen allergic, so when you bite into a raw apple, it's literally like you're putting pollen directly in your mouth, and you can get, you can get an allergic reaction in your mouth. So you get itching, tingling, you get tongue swelling. Um, in the mouth and throat, and, and about maybe 5%, up to 5% of the time can, can progress to a true anaphylaxis. Um, the treatment for this, you can, you know, how you know it's not a true food allergy is if you cook the food, you know, people can't bite into an apple, but these people can eat apple pie all day long without a problem, because when you heat the, that, that so extensively, the protein in the apple kind of changes, it's the conformation of the protein, it breaks it down so it no longer looks to your body, it's no longer recognized like it's that, that allergen. So you can cook the foods, you can just avoid them, you can kind of try to pre-medicate with antihistamines, which is what most of my patients do, it scares me a little bit. Um, or we can do allergy shots. You know, we never do shots to foods, but you can do allergy shots against the pollens, against our environmental allergens that are driving them crazy in the seasons anyway. And with time, as I kind of remove the allergy, their pollen allergy, it can, um, you know, decrease their uh, uh, reactions to the food, so they can start eating some of these fruits and vegetables as well. Like I said, it's, it's, you know, birch tree and apple are kind of the classic, but it, it pairs up very well um, with, the, with exactly which pollens and which fruits and vegetables. The ragweed is the big offender in the fall season, what drives all of us crazy in the fall. 
Um, and that tends to be more of like the melons and, and cucumber, that kind of thing. So it's just, it's interesting, but can progress to anaphylaxis. Peach is uh, specifically high risk. Um, so this is what we're talking about for, for the case. I don't, have y'all, have, has anyone ever heard of alpha, alpha gal? So um, it's a very, very long story about how this was discovered, and it's fascinating, but we're not gonna go into it too much. They noticed that people that were receiving a medication, a biologic called cetuximab, I think it's typically for uh, like colon cancers, head and neck cancers, were having first infusion anaphylactic reactions, which is odd because your immune system needs to have seen something first and be sensitized to it before you can react to it. Then they noticed that the people that were reacting on the first time ever of getting this biologic medication were in the southeast United States. And someone thought, you know, that kind of overlaps with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. <laughs> Um, so, what, so what this turns out to be is that it's a carbohydrate uh, antigen, this alpha-gal. Um, it's the main, you know, mammal, mammals have, we don't, humans don't have it, and it's the main reason we cannot xenotransplant, like between species, is this alpha-gal carbohydrate. So what happens, is, and this is wild, but the, the, the adult female, the lone star tick, again, in the distribution of the southeast, where we are, I see it all the time, um, will feed on a carrier like a deer, the mammal. They'll take some of that carbohydrate alpha-gal, and then the tick will bite you, the patient, not, not ideally, not you, <laughs> will bite the patient. Um, and then at the site of the tick bite, it takes the patient one to three months to develop IgE, that allergy antibody, against that carbohydrate. So then after, uh, at a tick bite, where where you know, you got transferred maybe sufficient alpha-gal carbohydrate. When you ingest mammalian products, that's beef, pork, and lamb, um, uh, otherwise rabbit, squirrel, um, two to six hours later, you can have, you know, hives, uh, swelling, anaphylaxis. So the classic case is somebody eats a hamburger for dinner um, and, and goes to bed fine, but then wakes up in the middle of the night in full-blown anaphylaxis. Um, this is the allergy where I make grown men cry. <laughs> uh, it, it's hard to tell somebody that because of a tick bite that they need to avoid all beef, pork, and lamb. That's hard to do. That's really hard to do. <laughs> and, and so, and, and, but it can be severe. And it's, and um, so especially the, the, that anaphylaxis in the middle of the night that wakes you up, the, you know, idiopathic anaphylaxis, we always scream for this now because it, the timeline's so off. You know, you don't think of something you ate six hours late, the sausage you ate six hours later, you know, that you've been eating fine your whole life, to the reaction you're having now. Um, so they, you generally do outgrow it. it. It'll take a few years, but um, they need to strictly avoid the foods. Avoid other tick bites is really key. Um, and carry epi. But really interesting. Um, you can have exercise-induced anaphylaxis. I saw a great case of this yesterday, a 15-year-old. Um, exercising, you know, it was like, it happened like last week, you know, in the, you know, height of pollen season, it's already started. Uh, you know, tree pollen's in high concentration now, and he's pollen allergic, he's exercising, really vigorous, vigorous, hard exercise at football practice, um, started getting itching all over, hives, swelling, and his vision started going. And by the time paramedics got to him, his blood pressure was like 80 over 40. They gave him epi in his arm, which we'll never do, right? <laughs> um, but, but it can, it's, it's really interesting, you know, and he'd had a couple, you know, less severe um, in a, you know, a couple years ago, um, reactions like this. Um, it, this, is, this is unsettling, this is scary, I think, for patients because it's unpredictable, you know, there's some things, like I said, you know, in the height of the pollen season, if you're really allergic, it's, you know, with heat, with really vigorous exercise, but it can still be unpredictable. Um, you know, I, I, I encourage patients to exercise, you know, in a buddy system. They cannot go to exercise by themselves. Um, they need to carry epi with them at all times. Um, but it can be difficult to really, to really prevent. Um, you can have otherwise this very specific, it's a totally separate thing, a, a food, it's like a food-related exercise-induced anaphylaxis. And the big offenders for this, oddly enough, are celery and wheat. So if you have... Um, celery or wheat within maybe two, three hours, either before, during, or after exercise, you know, you can eat those things fine all day long, 
but if you eat them within a time frame after exercising against a, especially vigorous exercise, you can anaphylax. Um, and so this young man had eaten, you know, pizza a couple hours before each episode and, and then wheat bread. And, um, and so I told him, I think he needs to not eat wheat for three hours before or after exercise. Um, again, really interesting, uh, but scary. Um, a venom hypersensitivity. Fire ant is a big culprit here in the southeast U.S. Um, you know, my mother is an allergist in Cincinnati, and I don't think she's ever seen a case of fire ant anaphylaxis, but um, I see it with, with pretty, you know, regularity. Um, so it's fire ant versus the hymenopter, like the flying insect. So that's like honeybee, yellow jacket, um, hornet, paper wasp. The clinical symptoms with this can be pretty variable, what reactions you can have to venoms. You can have you know, a large local reaction. So for example, if you get stung here, you know, large locals, all, you know, we tend to call if you're crossing two joint lines. So if you get stung here and you're, you get swollen enough that it's crossing your elbow and crossing the shoulder joint, um, that's a large local reaction. That's not an indication to test people for venoms. It's not an indication to put them on venom immunotherapy, like venom, you know, uh, insect allergy shots. Um, you can also have a cutaneous systemic, you know, reaction. So like, for example, if you get bit by a fire ant on your ankle, but you had hives everywhere else. I mean, it was a systemic, it was a whole body reaction, but it, nothing else internally was affected. No, no respiratory distress, no coughing, no vomiting. Um, and depending on the age, that may be an indication um, to put somebody on shots um, uh, versus just a true systemic like anaphylactic reaction. Um, for these people, I tend to try to, try to skin test them uh, as opposed to RAS testing them. RAS is the, the blood where we measure the specific IgE to these different things. I can measure it to a seemingly infinite number of things, to different venoms or pollens or, or, or what have you. Um, the problem with this, with RAS testing, the problem with drawing blood, and again, without a clear clinical history, is that if we took all of us in the room and, and I checked all of our blood work against the insect allergy, that it's about a third of us that, that would look like we're insect allergic in the blood work. But maybe we get stung and, and don't have a, the majority of us are gonna get stung and not have a problem. So you cannot just go based on numbers alone. You have to have a good clinical history. The skin testing is more reliable, so we'll, tr we'll try to do that um, before we blood test those people. Um, we have shots against the venoms and, and they're, they're well established, they're well validated, initially developed by the military and, and they're, and they're life-saving. Um, shots in general are about a five-year deal. Um, start, shots start out like once a week and eventually progress to once a month. For the venoms though, you can even go out to like every eight weeks. So you're only coming to the allergist office six times a year for your shot, it's not the worst deal. Um, and, and it'll protect you against future stings and bites that are hard to avoid. I mean, it's hard to avoid getting stung by these things, you know. It's hard to avoid fire ant bites. Um, and, and after five years, you stop the shots and, and it'll, you know, uh, you know, most of them, about 90% will go on to have continued kind of lifelong protection against the insect bites or stings. Um, the only exception to this is honeybee that doesn't, you know, uh, give you lifelong protection. So honeybee, unfortunately, is one that you have to do shots lifelong. Um, if you have a very severe reaction to an insect sting, and, and by that I mean shock, if people are getting you know, low blood pressures with it, it's about maybe 10% of them can have an underlying mastocytosis. Um, and so patients that have a very severe reaction to insect stings, I will check a baseline trip taste to make sure that we're not missing that. Um, there are a number of different uh, things that we can do to patients. Um, in my clinic, you know, even just the Skin prick testing itself can give people um, a severe systemic reaction. Um, you know, because if that patient is so allergic to whatever, it can be just be the pollens, you know. I've, I've had a, a vet a few months ago that, that we did 18 scratches on his back to like cat, dog, pollen, dust mite, cockroach, and he anaphylaxed and I had to give him epi afterwards. <laughs> Not what you think when you're coming uh, just to get skin testing. Um, but people can be very sensitive, again, especially if you're testing them and, and they're very allergic to that thing and if it's in the pollen season that they're allergic. Um, uh, the other things, you know, in my office, you know, we give a lot of a environmental allergy shots, venom immunotherapy shots. You know, those are always a risk for, um, for a reaction. So that's why, you know, the guidelines, you have to have a patient wait in the office for half hour after some kind of allergy shot. 
so they're monitored because most of the uh, severe reactions are going to be um, within that first 30 minute frame. You know, patients really be very wary if you hear a history of a patient getting shots, you know, at home. That's, that's very concerning and, and shouldn't be done. Um, a number of different medications, therapeutic and diagnostic agents. Um, like I said, opiates and IV contrast, and more of an anaphylactoid type reaction. Um, and as a side note, y'all realize that the, you know, the iodine contrast, right, has nothing to do with the shellfish allergy, right? It's a myth, not a thing. Um, hormones, again, allergy extracts, blood products, <laughs> vaccines can, can cause, rarely, um, anaphylactic or other allergic reactions, and we have I have very specific protocols for, t for skin testing and challenging vaccines to so the different components in vaccines. Um, anesthetic agents, uh, we, you know, rarely it comes up, a perioperative anaphylaxis. I had a, just recently a little girl anaphylaxed to um, eardrops <laughs> when she was getting tubes put in her ears. Um, Aspirin or, anti or, or the different NSAIDs can give you different uh, anaphylactic reactions, and we'll talk about that in a second. Latex used to be a very common cause of anaphylaxis, but it's not much anymore. Again, I mean, my mother, you know, 30 years ago when she started practicing would see a latex allergy all the time. Um, but now we don't. I think I've seen one case ever, uh, and everything's latex-free now. It's hard to, to find latex, and it can be hard to diagnose. A lot of our, the skin testing's not well validated. You know, what they recommend you kind of soak a little piece of a latex glove in saline for five minutes and then put that little patch on the patient's skin and try and prick through that. Um, tends not to work very well. You can, check, you can check a blood level, a specific IgE to latex. Um, you know, but it's hard to find a, a latex containing glove in the hospital. It's really hard. Now, thankfully, you know, our <laughs> clinic is located next to the adolescent clinic, so the so latex condoms are all over the place, so, so that's what we do. <laughs> but you can check a blood level to it, and really the only patients that are really at risk for latex now um, the classic patient's a spina bifida patient that was expo you know, has multiple surgeries, multiple procedures early on, so they were you know exposed a lot, sens become sensitized to it at some point. But again, with uh, you know, and so the spina bifida patients are at more high risk. But unless you've had a number of surgeries when you're very young, you know, it's it's very hard to have a true latex allergy. Um, and then different uh, you know antimicrobials, drug allergy that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, Aspirin and NSAIDs give you a lot of different reactions. They can give you the anaphylactoid, again, the non-IgE mediated reactions. If um, people have, you know, all the time chronic hives and swelling, um, if they take, you know, I ibuprofen, NSAIDs can make you more likely to exacerbate. They can, you know, you might be okay with your chronic hives, but then you take an ibuprofen and you're gonna flare. Uh, they're well known to do that. Um, you all have maybe heard of Samter's triad um, with uh, asthma, nasal polyps, and an aspirin allergy. Now, aspirin, in that sense, is not going to give you anaphylaxis. It's going to give you a reaction with your upper respiratory. These patients get real, a lot of nasal congestion, um, and it can cause a like, lower respiratory with an asthma exacerbation. So, so some of these patients um, with asthma and polyps can't take aspirin because they will have a, a, a severe you know, uh, asthma attack from it um, and but if in those kind of reactions if you you know if you take ibuprofen and you have hives and it flares you the same thing's gonna happen with the other NSAIDs it's gonna happen with um, you know naproxen and others okay uh, anaphylactic the true IgE mediated reactions it, it's only to that specific agent you know I have a, a teenager that anaphylaxed to ibuprofen um, and and, and it, it was an IgE an immediated, you know, quick onset anaphylaxis. Um, and so we challenged, you know, to prove, to reassure to her, you know, we ended up challenging her to another NSAID, and she did just fine. She has to avoid ibuprofen, but she can take every other NSAID. Um, so the options for this, like I said, you can use an alternative agent, like if you need to avoid ibuprofen, but take other NSAIDs. Leukotriene modifiers, so that's like singular, um, can help calm down some of the how reactive patients are, especially with that, that asthma, polyps, and aspirin. Um, it can help that specifically. And desensitization. You know, I've desensitized a number of patients with that 
um, asthma and polyps, what we call AERD, which is asthma uh, um, exacerbated respiratory disease. Um, and so those patients, we will desensitize them. You start out with a nose spray, very, very small doses of, an, of a um, COX-1 inhibitor, and then eventually get to the small doses of aspirin. Um, I can also desensitize people with like, a, you know, a car for cardiac reasons if they have an aspirin allergy and maybe they come in with an NSTEMI and um, need to get a left heart cath, but they want aspirin on board before, before the cath. Um, you know, what gets a lot of attention to is a beta-lactam like the penicillin allergy. When I was in medical school, um, I was taught that it's about 10% cross-reactivity between the penicillins and the cephalosporins. Um, and that used to be the case. It used to be the case when, you know, f you know things in, in, the, in the lab were not <coughs> mixed up so cleanly. Um, there was a lot of cross-contamination between the penicillins and cephalosporins. Um, but now with better practices, you know, it's, it's really uh, not much of an issue. Uh, the cross-reactivity is, is variable and it's, and it's much less than 1%. So get that 10% figure out of your head. Um, and the other interesting thing is that the allergy is directed at the side chain rather than the core beta-lactam ring. So the solid area there is, is the beta-lactam, the four-membered ring. Um, now on the side of it with the, the, um, the hollowed out arrow, um, the penicillin has kind of a five-membered ring, the cephalosporin six members, and that's in general the structure of the penicillin versus the cephalosporin. It's very rare to be allergic to the actual beta-lactam ring itself. I've only seen maybe two, three patients that have that allergy, again, that, that less than 1%, that you're cross-reactive to both. Um, the allergy really is directed at the side chain, and, and that's what we all fuss about, is how similar or dissimilar the side chain is. And there are groups, you know, that, uh, that I can tell you, you know, that share, uh, based on the chemical structure, the identical, you know, side chain structure. So um, the, the kind of top table are the R1 side chains, the, the, the uh, bottom table is the R2 side chains. Um, so, and, and they get grouped together. So if a patient, you know, um, for example, has a you know, reaction to amoxicillin, then I can tell them, okay, these are the three, you know, if you had a tree anaphylactic reaction to amoxicillin, you know, these are the three cephalosporins I automatically know you need to strictly avoid, okay? And so you can go by, by how similar or dissimilar the side chains are, but if they want a different penicillin or cephalosporin, say, le okay, let me skin test you to something in a different group that has a dissimilar side chain. I'll skin test them, I'll challenge them, and typically patients do fine because, again, their allergy is very side chain specific. It's not at the actual um, beta-lactam ring itself. Um, we've talked about a lot of different causes of anaphylaxis. You can have idiopathic anaphylaxis, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, this tends to be a problem more in adults and females. Uh, about half of them are atopic or allergic. Um, the next slide will talk about some of the kind of other clinical questions you might want to think about and ask when you're taking an, uh, an allergic reaction history. But this, this can be tough um, and very severe. Um, we'll try to put patients on prophylactic antihistamines, like the newer generation H1 antihistamines, like Zyrtec, Allegra, Zizol, that kind of thing. Um, if their reactions are coming severe enough and frequently enough, I've put patients on a trial of prednisone and kind of taper down over a few months. Um, uh, amalizumab is a, uh, the, the brand name for it is Zolaire, um, is, is a biologic, it's humanized, it's an IgG anti-IgE. So it's an IG, IgG molecule that binds up all the free-floating IgE allergy antibody in your system. And it's approved for, um, for asthma as well as, you know, hives, chronic urticaria. Um, but also, you know, can have a role sec kind of secondarily in, um, <coughs> in preventing these random anaphylactic events. Um, again, with a, a patient with idiopathic anaphylaxis, again, I'm, I'm screening them for mastocytosis. I'm getting a baseline serum tryptase. Um, if it's elevated on a couple occasions, I'm sending them to Hemonc to look for, um, you know, for maybe like a bone marrow biopsy um, to, to really uh, um, work through that diagnosis to see if they truly do have mastocytosis. Um, and then the alpha-gal, so, which is that delayed allergy to meat we talked about. This is a blood test. You check the specific IgE2. It's galactose alpha-1,3-galactose. 
Um, what you should not send off in the lab is alpha galactosidase, which screens for Fabry's disease. So we s tend to see that a lot too. Um, just make sure you s you're sending the correct thing. Um, this is just a little table, some things to think about, you know, in, in the different points when you're taking a history from a patient. Ask them if they have any, um, you know, other things that would make this worse. Where, where did it happen? Was this indoors, outdoors, you know, any related sting or bite? I mean, most of the time, it's not a sketchy story. You know, p you know if you get stung by something. It hurts, right? You, you know it, it, that tends to not run under the radar. Um, time of day or night, again, if it's a nighttime reaction, you want to think about alpha-gal. Um, how long the duration of the event is, if they have a prolonged, kind of anaphylactic event, then they're going to be much higher risk for doing this again and having severe reactions in the future. Um, recurrence of symptoms after they initially get over it, so that's like a biphasic reaction, maybe four to eight hours later. Um, and then the exact nature of their symptoms, you really want to get a very clear history about with, the, with skin, what internally was involved, what exactly happened, and what did the rash look like. And in a woman, another risk factor um, is, you know, the time around her uh, menstrual cycle can make you more likely to, to anaphylax during that time. So it's just some odd things. So things to think about. Um, so the clinical symptoms of anaphylaxis, again, typically we're talking fast. These are IgE-mediated reactions, seconds to minutes after exposure, and the more rapid uh, the reaction, the more, the, you know, the onset, the more severe it is. Um, when I'm telling patients about, you know, the definition of anaphylaxis is, is hard and is still hotly debated. Um, but in general, what I try to tell patients, because I think it makes sense, is they have some kind of skin finding, plus you have one other organ system that's affected. So for skin, that can be, you know, it can be hives, it can be swelling, like a fat lip, it can be um, flushing, just like they, like they have a sunburn kind of thing, but there's no otherwise rash. Um, or it can be pruritus, just itching with no rash. If you're itching head to toe with nothing on you, that, that still counts. Um, and then, you know, again, something internally is affected. So cardiovascular wise is that hypotension, you're dropping your blood pressures, are you, um, uh, you know, getting tachycardic? Now that, that one's a little more tough. I think, you know, you're anxious during this event and, and I'd be tachycardic too. Um, respiratory wise, it can be upper respiratory. This can be, you know, these patients get itchy eyes. They're, they're, they're whites of their eyes look bloodshot all of a sudden. They, their nose is pouring. It can be lower respiratory as well with um, wheezing, chest, often they'll complain to chest tightness. Um, and they can, they can be coughing, you know, in general more than wheezing. They'll be wheezing maybe if you listen to them, but they're going to be, what you're going to hear is coughing and they're going to complain of chest tightness. Um, GI, you can have nausea, vomiting, I would say more than diarrhea, but I try to give patients a few examples. If you're really itchy head to, you know, if you think you've gotten in contact with your allergen, you're itching head to toe and you know, you're nauseous and feel like you're going to throw up. You need to use your EpiPen, right, your epinephrine. Um, you could be hives plus, you know, wheezing. You know, you, ha you have to use your epinephrine for that. Um, and I feel like some of the upper respiratory signs can be an early sign of anaphylaxis, um, just like the skin findings can. Again, itching without a rash. My, my mentor, who's traditionally given this lecture and retired within the past couple years, um, would give epi at the drop of a hat in, in the VA clinic. And it always used to surprise me. You know, a patient got an allergy shot, five minutes later comes back and they're like, gosh, I'm itching all over. He's like, epi. <laughs> But, uh, but I, th I think, you know, now there's a lot of wisdom to it. And, other th and like I said, upper respiratory too. If we give a patient an allergy shot and they start sneezing, I I'm asking my nurses, who's sneezing? Who just coughed? Who's sneezing? You know, that, that's a sign. And you need to, you need to watch out for that. I, we don't like sneezing in our clinic. Um, but I think there's a lot of wisdom in it because these reactions, like you've seen, can progress quickly. And just because they, they you know, start out with skin findings, don't mean they're going to progress. You, you know, we'll talk about more of the treatment. So, but most of the time, there, there are cutaneous findings. About 90% of the time, so there's going to be some kind of skin involvement. The more severe reactions um, skip the skin and go straight to um, what's internal. So without cutaneous findings, that's a sign maybe of a more severe uh, anaphylactic reaction. Uh, respiratory symptoms about half of the time. You know, dizziness, it can be hypotension. They're all equivalent in my mind about uh, a third of the time or less. 
Um, abdominal, again, nausea, vomiting, cramping, abdominal pain, uh, a little less than a third. So these are just some pictures of, um, of, of hives. I don't know how clear they are up there. Um, they can be small. They can become confluent. They look like, you know, mosquito bites. They're not teeny tiny red little dots. Um, I, peop, I usually ask patients about, like I said, mosquito bites, and they always say whelps, right? A whelp is a female dog, right? We're talking whelps with a T or hives. <laughs> um, they can have some central clearing, but um, do tend to be raised. This is um, pretty typical angioedema which is asymmetric by definition. You know, patients can get some kind of prodromal tingling, numbness in the lip, um, but it usually starts out on one side. And then maybe by the time you see them, though, can be, can be bilateral, but, but oftentimes does start on one side and progress. Um, this is scary, angioedema. <laughs> this patient needs maybe an, an advanced airway <laughs> uh, for airway protection. Um, some of the pathologic findings, I mean, again, I, I think, uh, you know, aside from the elevated serum tryptase within one to six hours after the event, like we talked about, a lot of these are not really used clinically. Um, you know, I'm not measuring eosinophilic infiltrates in, in their, their sputum. Um, it's not really done outside of a research setting. You get pulmonary hyperinflammation, as you can imagine, and, and upper airway edema at, at various points in the uh, upper respiratory tract. Um, the differential diagnosis is pretty, pretty broad. It can be vasovagal, um, carcinoid with some diarrhea, flushing, and other flushing syndromes. Uh, again, mastocytosis if, it, if uh, the reaction is very severe. Hereditary angioedema, you can really diagnose at any age. Um, and the patient with hereditary angioedema, um, they'll have angioedema but no hives. You know, hives and swelling go together all day long. I see it all day long. But if, the, if it's swelling alone, it's odd. It's very odd. You need to think about it's probably either an ACE inhibitor, it's hereditary angioedema, or it's acquired angioedema from maybe an underlying malignancy. Um, vocal cord dysfunction can give you a lot of strider, panic, tachycardia. Patients can pass out. Uh, it can be pretty dramatic. Um, and then, like I said, this, this alpha gal. Um, so the treatment, right, is epinephrine. And if that fails, then it's more epinephrine. And if that fails, it's more epinephrine. Okay. The other things I put maybe bullet point number seven in tinier print, these other things are supportive, right? You're not reaching for Benadryl um, to treat anaphylaxis. It's supportive, but, but Benadryl is going to take, just like any other antihistamine, it's going to take about maybe half hour, 45 minutes to get working in your serum and in concentrations I can detect. And like we've seen, I mean, you don't have 45 minutes for <coughs> anaphylaxis. So the treatment is epinephrine. Don't be afraid to give it. Um, you know, steroids, IV fluids, albuterol nebs, oxygen, glucagon, if it's refractory. <coughs> um, the first step in general is prevention. You know, patients knowing their triggers, knowing what to avoid, taking a good history, labeling, labeling that patient's chart, and having your, you know, the office staff or the staff wherever you are in the emergency room department, wherever, you know, being educated and know how to, how to recognize the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. Um, patients can wear a medic alert bracelet, uh, we might get them to discontinue beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or a specific risk with venom allergy. Um, again, venom immunotherapy is life-saving and can prevent uh, anaphylaxis. Um, desensitizing to drugs, um, epi, PRN, and, and probably an allergist evaluation. There are a lot of different um, <laughs> protocols that you might have for your office. Uh, SOP, like a standard operating procedure, we're in the final stages of, of revising R, so if, if anyone would like that, I'm happy to share that. Um, this is one that, that the World Allergy Organization puts out. I'll let you all read that. Um, I like it because it stresses, you know, what to do is, you know, remove the trigger, assess the patient, call for more help, inject epi, and then think about other things at the same time. You know, I, I think it, it prior, prioritizes nicely epinephrine. You always want to lay the patient down on their back. First thing in an anaphylaxis, if a patient starts, if they call me out of a room because the patient, they're worried a patient's reacting, they, they have already laid the patient down. If the patient's pregnant, you put them on their left lateral side because if, if they're anaphylaxing enough, severely enough to the point where they're dropping their blood pressure, if they go from a supine position to sitting upright, your ventricle, uh, you know, your, your cardiac ventricle can empty very quickly and you can kill someone instantaneously that way. <laughs> so put them laying down uh, and keep them there until the reaction's resolved. 
they need to take medicines or something. You know, a lot of them are going to be IV. It's not like they're in their, might be vomiting anyway, so they're going to be on their side laying down anyway. Um, so again, put them in a recumbent position. Um, epi uh, is IM, not sub Q. It is in the anterior lateral thigh. Don't give it an arm. Don't give it anywhere else. Um, the dose, the ideal dose is not really well established, but you can repeat it every five minutes. And that's why people have to carry their epinephrine auto injectors in, in a pairs, right? They cannot keep one at school and one at home. Okay, they can't keep one in their car and one at work. You can't do that. Then you need two at school, two with them at all times, because sometimes you know, one's not enough. If you're still having that reaction five minutes later, you need the other epi. Um, and it can be life saving. Um, you know, remove the inciting allergen, ABCs, and start CPR, or get more help. I think in your, if you're in an outpatient world and you're in clinic, if, you're, if you, you give one epi and feel comfortable monitoring them, fine. But if you're giving two epi in the outpatient world, you need to be calling, you need to be calling 911. Um, and that's what our protocol is in the clinic too. If we are giving two epi, which is maybe five to six times a year, it's not often, um, we call a code. We don't call our rapid response team because our rapid response team takes about 13 minutes to get to us. And you don't have that much time. Um, so four to six hours is about how long the guidelines say to observe the patient longer if they have a very severe history of a reaction um, or if any level of you know, severity of asthma. Um, IV access oxygen, refractory anaphylaxis, um, refractory hypotension, you can do, you know, really ramp up the um, IV fluids you're giving them. I mean, all the doses are there. Um, different IV vasopressors, again, it, you know, um, IV epinephrine, if, if I, you know, you've given them multiple doses of IM epi not working, then you'll, then you'll probably go to uh, IV epinephrine. They're on a cardiac monitor at this point. <laughs> um, refractory bronchospasm, again, nebulized albuterol, but that's supportive, right? That you're, you need to treat the underlying cause, which is anaphylaxis um, with epi. Um, a patient on a beta blocker um, can blunt the effects of epinephrine, and so a, a patient with refractory anaphylaxis taking a beta blocker, you're going to want to think about glucagon. These are the different epinephrine auto injectors out there. EpiPen's been in the press a lot lately. Um, there's been a lot of concern over the cost of these different medications. Um, Myelin is the, is the company that makes EpiPen, and they do have a generic as well. It looks the exact same. Still going to cost about $300 um, for a generic set of epinephrine injectors. And again, they need two in every place, right? And so patients are afraid to use it because they don't want to. They don't want to buy it again. They're they're afraid of having to buy it again. Um, on the bottom is AdrenaClick, which is the more generic epi. Um, I think it's a little more confusing. It comes in the case, you pull it off, and then you have two blue ends to pull off. It tells you what which end is the needle end, but in a reaction, parents or patients are, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of flipping out. You're, um, and I've had a number of patients, you know, try to inject themselves and inject their thumb uh, instead. And the needle is not auto retract with the adrenal click, which is, you know, then concerning too. Um, AviQ is kind of the newest one to the market. It's a credit card sized. It's um, thinner than a deck of playing cards. Um, but that one. Um, you know, it does automatically retract just like the EpiPen does. It um, talks to you. It talks you through it. I meant to bring one. Um, it talks you through a reaction um, and is free for anyone out of pocket, you know, that has commercial insurance. Um, so um, I, I think for most commercial patients, honestly, I think I've been prescribing AviQ and for the mm -hmm. Medicaid, you know, Medicare patients have been prescribing the generic epinephrine. Um, and they all do come in two different strengths. There's the, uh, the pediatric dose, which is 0.15 milligrams for anyone under 66 uh, pounds. Um, and then everyone, everyone over 66 pounds will get the regular adult dose of epi, which is the 0.3 milligram dose. But again, this is not an exact science. I think a lot of allergists out there tend to be, if you're over 50 pounds, we'll, we'd rather err on the side of, you know, uh, not, you know, maybe overdosing you rather than underdosing you. Again, the dose of this is not well established, and I don't want to undertreat someone with anaphylaxis. So, those weight guidelines are a little subjective. Um, and again, like we talked about other risk factors for a severe anaphylaxis um, asthma at any level severity, if they've had prior bad reactions, and being a teenage male um, places you specifically at risk. It, the conversation I'm having with with my patients is very like a peanut allergy, for example. You know, it's very different from the, 
parents of a two-year-old I'm diagnosing with peanut allergy and I'm spending the entire visit trying to calm them down and reassure them. And you know, then when that kid is older, it's a come to Jesus meeting <laughs> because they think they can test the limits and they can you know, try these different things and, and, and they can't because you generally don't outgrow it. So that's all I have. So thank you. What questions do y'all have for me, <coughs> if anything? Yeah? Two things. One is, um, in their medical accident, it's an ultimately tested and almost deadly if the patient were doing an excellent job, because they don't want you to give them high blues that they haven't been picked up for a month or, or ages, uh, number one. And then what is your experience with household flus, dog and cat flus, and the FDA has got a vaccine? Yeah, so, um, so the first question was um, about anaphylaxis and being concerned that the intramuscular administration is not getting in quickly enough, if the, especially if the patient is in shock. Again, and again, you know, in the outpatient world, I mean, that's all you've got, right? In the inpatient world or in the emergency department, you know, if a patient is not responded, you're right, and they have refractory anaphylaxis with shock to, uh, you know, a couple epi, two to three IM epi, then, then you are probably looking at one of those other IV vasopressors like you know, like IV epi. Um, you know, the IV formulation is more high, you know, more high risk as if for patients with especially cardiac disease underlying. Um, you know, the, the data, the studies still say that, you know, it's in favor of giving it, you know, whenever you're giving, especially IV epinephrine, and I've had been consulted on a, a few cases where IV epinephrine was administered maybe, you know, without trying IM first, and, and teenagers can, can, you know, you can precipitate a, you know, an MI and a heart attack in a patient. Right, it is much, it's a much more dilute concentration, yes, than, than I am. My epinephrine, uh, about a half a, a scoop of it, and then diluted with 10 cc's of water, mm -hmm. shake it, and I'll sit it, and squirt the, the syringe out, mm -hmm. and then put the, the IV fluid back in, and then very slowly titrate it with the patient and all the doctors I've done for it. Right, I mean, it has to be done very cautiously, and. You know, you just have to monitor the patient because the point of that be is that it's, it's vasoconstricting to try and bring up your blood pressures, but you're also vasoconstricting your, you know, your, um, your coronary, your coronaries, and so that's when you can precipitate, especially in someone with already stenosed vessels and plaques, you know, and you. Right. Well, that, that's it. Yeah. Totally agree. Yes. You, you'd rather give it than not give it. You know, the fear of doing that should not prevent you from, yes, and this, like I said, the studies would agree with that. You know, it's in favor of giving it. Don't let the fear of it. And about the fleas. Yeah, so the next question was about, um, was about household fleas, um, more in the seasonal changes. You know, it's not a common, um, not a very common cause of anaphylaxis that I see. Um, most of the, most of the time, you know, I think fleas are not gonna give you like an anaphylactic reaction. Um, they're, you know, again, but just the seasonal changes enough. I mean, cat, dog, those things alone can, can cause an anaphylaxis, especially, you know, with different factors going on. But fleas, I don't see much. Mm. You haven't had any in your practice? No, not to fleas, no. Yeah, yes. So, so we, we do 30 minutes, um, and that's what kind of our national allergy guidelines, our practice parameters kind of, you know, identify is that you need to monitor a patient for half an hour because the chances of, after the half hour mark, your chances of having a severe allergic reaction like at home um, is going to be much less. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, uh, so, again, so the question was how, you know, how long should you monitor a patient like, in, you know, maybe in the office after various injections? Um, and, and the guidelines, our practice parameters will, will say 30 minutes um, because the chance of having a severe allergic reaction at home outside of that 30 minute window is very, very low. Um, no, I think, it, I think 30 minutes is a good guideline for IgE mediated reactions. Again, I mean, you know, part of it depends on the history of the patient. If I'm looking for that delayed allergy to meet, sure, I'm not monitoring for 30 minutes. That's a long challenge. It's like a six hour challenge. 
Um, or if they have a history of a very delayed reaction to something, you would want to go based on that past little you know, piece of clinical history as well. Um, but um, I, I think at 30 minutes, I think it's sufficient for, like I said, IgE-mediated reactions. And so what do you think that model is for or even in dose range? I think so, yeah, yes. What about vasovagal reactions? Vasovagal reactions? Um, it, it can, uh, again, it can, be, it can be tough to tell with some of these whether, you know, patient is, um, you know, dropping their pressure because of a vasal vagal reaction or if it's a true anaphylactic reaction. I mean, that's, that's where, you know, the clinical history is going to, um, you know, I think help. That's where, you know, not immediately but later on down the line, a baseline trip case is going to help you, you know, know what's going on um, to see if it was an anaphylactic versus, you know, a vasal vagal reaction. But it's certainly in the differential. And it can be tough to tell if we give a patient an allergy injection. You know, if they pass out, it's, it's very hard to tell. So. Did so, does someone over here have a question? Oh, yeah. So I do think that stress can certainly play or anything that kind of revs up your immune system. Um, you know, we call it angioedema for swelling, but it used to be called angioneurotic edema. <laughs> which is not very PC, but, um, but, that, but because, they, I mean, patients really felt like stress was the trigger for their reactions, and I do think that's true. I do. Wow, yeah. Yeah, oh my gosh. I, yeah, I mean, you know. I, I would, you know, I think stress contributes to it. I would be hesitant to call it, you know, to be the primary reason for a, a severe anaphylaxis like that. You know, I'd be looking for other things. And it may end up being idiopathic anaphylaxis, you know, but I'd rather call it that than the stress, you know. It, like I said, it may be a contributing factor, but maybe not the, the underlying primary problem. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here you go, thank you. Thanks.